sufficient phosphorus, you could say, okay, I don't want to take more phosphorus back to that part. I'll take it over here to the phosphorus pore section or something, or nitrogen. So, um, and then get rid of imported petroleum. That's the goal. Ideal biomass system. And again, I sent this. Uh, I sent this PowerPoint slide. So, so if you're interested, you can read all this stuff. But basically, we want to take care of the soil. That's the first listed, which means you're going to have to recycle nutrients and micronutrients. Very important for the health of the soil long term. If you make the fertilizer from the plant residue, we can take a quarter to a half a ton of corn stalks per acre, and there's usually about four to five ton available per acre of corn ground. And make enough ammonia fertilizer to fertilize that acre of corn ground, so you don't have to use any fossil fuels to do that. Uh, we don't want to reinvent everything, so currently variable harvesting and planting techniques, no fossil fuels, cost effective, locally economic development. <coughs> what we'll have to do is the biorefinery concept. And you know, as much as I bash petroleum companies and, 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 and like doing it, um, <laughs> they're a great business people. They know how to make money. And their model is basically they take a barrel petroleum, they make pharmaceutical grade chemicals out of it in some cases. They make cosmetics and, and, and specialty chemicals out of it, and then they make uh, commodity chemicals, and then when they get down the at the bottom of the barrel, so-called, you're making gasoline, diesel fuel, and then road tar. And we want to pick off those higher value things. Use their business model with plant materials. So food first, then high value chemicals, pharmaceuticals, then specialty chemicals, then commodity chemicals, and if we have anything left over, then we'll make fuel additives. And let's not go gung-ho and say we're going to make all our fuel from, from plant material. And I wish you could, I wish I, but that's the area I work in, I don't think you can. Uh, there's not enough. Or, or, or we have to drive a lot less. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, efficiency first. I mean, you always should do that. We need to reduce that, but I'm afraid you won't do that unless you see five, six dollar a gallon gasoline. Um, this seems to be, a, to me, a good way of doing it. It's almost like mowing your grass. Um, and if you take things like this, this would be corn silage or sorghum silage. You take it off, you chop it off into this fine mixture, you put it in what's called a, a, a silo, um, to store silage, and it's basically a pickling process. Um, the sugars that are in there turn to lactic acid and preserve it, um, so it's, it's just like a, a pickling process keep the oxygen out and then it lasts for a long, long time. So it's a great way to store it. But if you harvest this way, you harvest early in the season when the corn's still <coughs> wet. So you're talking about end of August, maybe first of September in that area. And then you don't have to turn the soil over. And one of the big problems, one of the reasons they're taking so many corn stalks off now from acre of corn ground is the buildup of corn stalks over time it is taking, number one, it takes a huge amount of fertilizer to break that down. And, and uh, Number two, you almost have to plow it under to get it to incorporate and work back into the soil. If you take it off, process it through an animal or through a biorefinery, then you bring back the good stuff. Um, that to me looks like it's going to be the best model. And when you do that early, well that's just, that's the old fashioned way of storing silage in a harvester storage bin. That's the new fashioned way, it looks like sausage tubes uh, to store and you can do pit silos and things like that. But if you harvest early, the best time to grow grass in Iowa is September. If you plant grass seed in Iowa in September and water it, it's going to go 99 times out of 100. If you harvest that early in the season instead of waiting to the end like the harvest corn now, you could always do this. And this is Wisconsin, which is farther north than Iowa, of course. You can really cover the soil well with a secondary cover crop. And you can just either spray it or, or till it in or whatever you want to do in the spring or harvest, whatever that is. It could be winter wheat, it could be rye, it could be triticale. Um, but you really cut down the water and soil erosion when you do that cover crop. And so that harvesting system seems to be much better. We're trying for the circle. Water, sunshine, uh, carbon dioxide, grow the plants, process it locally, and bring everything back to the, to the same spot. Anaerobic digestion, by the way, is a really nice technology for that. Um, we have six different ways of converting plant materials into chemicals and fuels over there. Anaerobic digestion, which I think is a great technology, and I know you guys are using that around here. At, at Norm, could levels. you back up a couple to the DMAC? <coughs> um, yeah, DMEC, yeah. Community College. Um, basically, they got a bunch of people together at the community colleges and organized and brought them out to our facility and they wanted to see what the potential was for creating jobs in this area. And that was right before <laughs> the ethanol plants and biodiesel plants were on the rise, being built like crazy, and there's going to be a bunch of new jobs. And since then, they've, you know, 
they're not building any new ones right now, and there's a question whether or not that industry will survive because of uh, uh, tax credit issues and, and things like that. By the way, the oil companies had rumors going on before they built the ethanol plants in Iowa. They said, go ahead, build them. Uh, we'll create market conditions uh, such that you'll go bankrupt and we'll buy you out 10 cents on the dollar. Two years ago, Valero, the biggest independent oil refiner in the United States, bought out Verisun, who was in bankruptcy, which was the biggest ethanol producer in the United States. So an oil company bought them out. The only part of the rumor that wasn't true was it was 30 cents on the dollar instead of 10 cents on the dollar. <laughs> I don't like those guys. <laughs> Nobody's going to change my mind. Um, anyway, so that's, but that didn't, not, not much came about from that. Uh, we're, we're, we're a little shut down right now in terms of new jobs creating in that, because we're just not quite there yet. Uh, I think the economics are there, though. So six different ways, anaerobic digestion, uh, fermentation. We like to see things like sweet sorghum instead of corn for alcohol production in this area. Thermal gasification, use heat to turn the plant materials into carbon monoxide and hydrogen. That's just like Lego building blocks for chemical engineers. They put them together and you can make everything from alcohols to plastics to uh, diesel fuel. It's, it's really neat technology. The uh, Germans did a lot of the, the work back in World War II for that type of thing. Sassol makes all these chemicals from coal in South Africa and have done it for years. Um, so the technology is there, you just haven't seen it much with biomass. Pyrolysis, another heat-based process. Makes something looks like bio crude oil. It's got some nasty chemicals in that too. Just because you start with biomass doesn't mean you have to uh, relax and say, well, we're producing everything that's safe. But there's some nasty chemicals when you get, yeah. Is that the technology that's used to make um, like oil from tires and things like that? Um, yeah, yeah, similar technology, yeah. Someone was telling me about it and there's a, there's a catalyst that you can add to it that um, reduces the um, emissions from it? Do you know anything? Yeah, you know, again, it's not a real mature industry, but catalysts help improve the process, get more selectivity, you, you get more of the product you want. And with the different catalysts, you'll change it towards more of the product you want. And then you just do it randomly with just heat, you'll produce a range of products. Do you so. think even with the catalyst, it could really significantly reduce emissions from it? Because it just seems like such a nasty thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree <laughs> with you. but. Oil companies love that technology because what they see is a chance to get low-cost starting material from biomass and say they're doing a great amount of good and yeah. then ship it all the way down to their processing facility. So if the oil companies like it, I don't like it, but that's one that's out there, so i just tell you about it. Okay. Sir, and I, I agree with you. It's a, I like anaerobic digestion. I, I kind of like thermal gasification. And uh, the supercritical fluids one I really like. It's, a, it's really one of the most unexplored technologies out there in terms of conversion. Um, any fluid, whether it be carbon dioxide, water, alcohols, completely changes characteristics under high pressure conditions. And almost everybody in the world comes in and says, yeah, we believe that oil, petroleum oil, came from plant materials buried under high pressure conditions for millions of years formed petroleum. We can turn plant materials into oils in a matter of seconds with these units. In fact, it happens so fast we have a hard time controlling it. Um, carbon dioxide, supercritical, takes caffeine out of coffee for you. It used to be hexane, which is a carcinogen, so you didn't want to use to drink decaf coffee, now you're fine because carbon dioxide does the job for you. We found that alcohols can turn cellulose into propylene ethylene glycol, really high value, high volume chemicals used for antifreeze uh, in one step. And the chemistry professor who was actually retired and just working on our project, uh, teaching one class, um, had a hard time explaining how that could happen, the chemical route to get there. But that's, uh, that's a really unexplored territory and has a lot of potential. The secret is going to be combined systems where the waste from one is a starting point for the other. You start off with carbon dioxide, uh, water, and, and sunlight, and make dozens of types of chemicals, dozens of different types of food, process everything, minimize air and water emissions, and take the nutrients that came off, because there's no need to have nutrients in a plastic bottle or a... Uh, if it's not food and you're making it for other uses like chemicals, then take those nutrients back to the soil. Now closed loop, so you're producing all your own energy, recycling all the good things back to the soil, and, uh, but the real model is, the ultimate goal is the Iowa biorefinery, where you're making hundreds of products from a ton of things you can grow in the, in the, in the field. Um, just copying the oil refinery model in terms of a business model, but doing it in a sustainable fashion that actually improves soil quality as you go. 
instead of tearing down so it falls. Are there any negative byproducts of it all? Yeah. I mean, you just can't have zero. <laughs> can't, get, can't get to zero. I mean, that negative? Well, you know, methane from the cows is going to be a greenhouse gas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to stop that. <laughs> I jokingly said we were going to have a methane collection unit on the back end of a cow here. <laughs> we really did not fund that project, so I don't want to get the rumor started. But yeah, you, so you can't have zero emissions. There's just, there's just no way around it. But uh, your, your goal is to, you know, improve as much as you can. And, um, yeah, I mean, you're going to be way, way, way better than the petroleum model. Just, you, you can't, again, I don't think you can do worse than the petroleum model, and you can do much, much better. Um, I mean, even if you look at uh, letting free-range cows, they're going to go where the grass is the best in the pasture, and they're going to go and do their job where they eat, and so that area of the pasture is going to get, unless you redistribute the nutrients where it's needed, it, you can almost be better than nature in that case. You can redistribute the nutrients right where you know they're needed if you bring them in, put them back out. So um, I don't know. There's nothing perfect, though. You know, I can never say zero emissions. We had one guy say zero emissions the other day from ammonia engines, and I said, mm, no, we can't say that anymore. Uh, but so, right. question, question for you on yeah. the, the previous biorefining slide. Um, you, you, the, um, you know, we had talked before one time about how um, this maybe you're going 